uh, with uh, some words about the institute, uh, which I uh, has uh, have honor to present. Um, the Babil of All Russian Institute of Plant Genetic Resources and uh, Nikolai Vavilov, uh, the director founder of this institute, who collected with his uh, uh, colleagues um, famous collection of plant genetic resources, real collection, uh, and it is a real treasure. This is uh, the base for plant breeding, for food security, and genetic technology development. And uh, here are some collage of uh, famous Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg and the building of Avilov Institute. And uh, I would like to state that uh, the treasure in Avilov Institute is uh, uh, something uh, equal, uh, something uh, uh, special like the treasure in Hermitage. And the Institute was founded in Russian Empire uh, with the Ministry of Agriculture and State Property. And um, it was uh, the, the task of the Institute, which was first a very small bureau, was documentation and systematization of data about uh, varieties of different crops which are valuable for uh, Russian Empire. And later, the third director of bureau, Robert Tregel, began to uh, found it collection. It was collection of barley. And uh, when he presented his collection in 1906 uh, uh, in Milan, uh, it was awarded with the first prize. And in 1920s, uh, Nikolai Vavilov uh, became a director of the Institute. This um, uh, co co collection missions work uh, was uh, scaled uh, very much, and um, he uh, organized uh, about 180 expeditions with his colleagues uh, all, uh, across all con continents, across five continents and uh, 65 countries. And they collected about 200,000 uh, samples of different crops and their wild relatives. And then this collection was growing, and now it is uh, more than uh, three, uh, 300,000 samples. And this is, uh, here you can see uh, to the right side, the uh, pyramid, the security pyramid, and the base for this pyramid for breeding, for uh, seed production, for plant production, uh, the real base is uh, genetic diversity uh, in uh, collection. And uh, I would like to say that genetic diversity in plant production in our today's fields is quite low. As one can imagine uh, that uh, the genetic diversity will be uh, restricted by plants present in fields. Uh, if one can imagine that uh, one moment that there would uh, that collections disappear, so then breeding will stop in several years, and uh, there will be big problems with, with food security. And here you can see the northern border of uh, crop production in USSR. The solid line is uh, the border in 19, 1917. And the uh, dotted line is the border in, 19, uh, 50, in 1954. So you can see that the collected samples, they were used uh, in breeding, they were used uh, for, uh, to extend zone area, um, for significant uh, extendance of zone areas. Let's continue. So here you can see the map with network of lead experimental stations. Uh, they are needed. So this network, uh, network of experimental stations is needed for maintenance of the collection. And um, uh, Nikolai Vavilov established uh, most of these stations, but also he established stations not only for you, uh, but uh, also in different regions of USSR. He established uh, breeding stations. For example, in uh, 1924, 
Uh, the experimental station was established in Gyumri in Armenia. And in this photo, you can uh, see director and deputy director of Gyumri breeding station visiting me this year. And um, why, why uh, we can uh, uh, permanently care about uh, breeding, about uh, creation of new varieties? Uh, this is because uh, uh, environmental challenges like biotic stress, different viruses, fungi, uh, pests, and also abiotic stress and climate change. And of course, uh, uh, breeders uh, need to answer uh, demands from uh, market and follow some new trends like uh, uh, new varieties for functional food for the uh, for special diets. And so breeding is ongoing for centuries, but the methods, the methods uh, developed and changed and you can see uh, the results of breeding, for example, in previous centuries uh, from the pictures from painting, from painting uh, of uh, uh, very, very famous um, artists. And uh, below uh, you can see uh, the uh, results of breeding of modern breeding. You can see a uh, difference. And uh, here um, it is shown uh, the growing contribution of genetics uh, to the uh, breeding methods. And uh, especially in, uh, in the last century, uh, we moved from traditional breedings uh, to new methods, which are based on uh, use uh, knowledge on um, our genes at DNA level, and also we get tools of <coughs> um, genomics and omics technologies, and also genetic engineering, and finally uh, new methods, new genetic technologies based on genome editing. So genome editing is very famous now, especially CRISPR-Cas system. So um, researchers uh, didn't really invent it, they just uh, copy uh, what, what happens in some bacteria with uh, their immune system. So, and um, scientists copied this, uh, uh, this tool. So this tool consists of um, a special protein nuclease uh, and uh, so-called uh, guide RNA. And uh, this uh, construction uh, make, uh, Double strand breaks uh, in, uh, in 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 uh, site of genome in desired sites of genome. What happens then after that? After that, the uh, double strand break is repaired uh, by uh, cell um, reparation systems, and uh, with high probability you will get a mutation after reparation. So this is some kind of side-directed mutagenesis and compared to irradiation or chemically induced mutations, um, <clears throat> this method is uh, much more precise. So with uh, chemical, uh, chemical or radiation induced mutagenesis, you need to screen after that uh, thousands and thousands of plants uh, to find uh, among them uh, uh, the plants with um, uh, desired mutations. But with genome editing, with side directed mutagenesis, uh, you get a uh, desired mutant, um, ju just desired mutant, uh, with uh, very, very few of target effects. When you compare the, uh, this CRISPR Cas system, editing system, with so called classical transgenesis, you can see that uh, <coughs> uh, genome engineer engineering approach, uh, they uh, do not uh, leave accessory sequencing sequences in genome. Uh, so while uh, classical transgenesis uh, approaches, they leave accessory sequences in, in genome. And so with genome editing, you get uh, modified but not transgenic lines. And here you can see some first results of application of this uh, editing system in uh, plants, in crops. So, for example, here in rice, uh, they are uh, not out of negative regulations of grain weight, 
uh, was performed and uh, uh, this uh, resulted in uh, increase of yield of rice yield here you can see example on barley then not knock out of one uh, single gene um, allowed obtaining uh, so-called name native barley which is easier to kill and here you can see also example on tomato the knockout of um, <clears throat> a single gene uh, allowed achieving uh, simultaneous ripenings of tomato fruits and here are some uh, summary of uh, achievements uh, uh, in first five years uh, after uh, first application of this forecast system in plants uh, you can see uh, uh, many crop plants and uh, many genes, especially in rice, in tomato, and wheat, which were edited. And uh, uh, what, what else can be done with uh, these genetic technologies? So I would state that uh, we can use genetic technologies like some kind of time machine. So we can uh, go to the past. So uh, we can go to domestication process. So then Homo sapiens spread uh, across the continents. So people appeared in uh, different regions, not equal regions from the point of view of genetic diversity, of one genetic diversity. You can see here these uh, red numbers, the number of um, grasses which um, uh, match to uh, requirements for domestication candidates. So these were plants with, uh, with uh, large seeds, uh, fast growing plants with high yield and ability to store harvested seeds or fruits. And uh, these were regions of plant domestication. And here you can see some crops which were domesticated in um, <clears throat> uh, Southwestern Asia, Southeastern Asia and in uh, America about um, genetic changes during domestication. So molecular genetic study discovered for us that there are just a few domestications, domestication mutants. Here you can see very good example, uh, wild rice and cultivated rice. So when uh, seeds on wild rice are ripening, so and similar for other plant species, for wild plants, it is typical when seeds are ripening, so they fall down. And for and this is adaptation to, uh, to have offspring uh, in uh, wild nature. But uh, for cultivated plant and uh, this, let us say, uh, plants founders of um, crops, of known crops, they were mutants. And to the right side, you, you can see mutants and in which the grains, they do not fall down uh, on the earth after ripening, on the soil after ripening. And in wild nature, this such kind of mutant would, uh, would not uh, give offspring, but uh, in uh, human hands, it became first cultivated, for the first domesticated plant, because it was uh, more convenient for cultivation. Uh, and also, you can see, for, for example, in maize, to the left, you can see a uh, wild relative of maize called Tersinka, and to the right side, the maize you know, and the difference there is just due to uh, three form mutation, like a change of one row with two multi row with, uh, and uh, with uh, naked seeds in uh, maize compared to uh, seeds protected uh, with. Um, very strongly attached bloom and very thick bloom. And also in Telsin, you have the child rachis, uh, while in maize, uh, you have uh, stone rachis. And here also you can see tomato, to the left wild tomato and to the right cultivated tomato. Uh, cultivated tomato has a couple of uh, mutants compared to wild tomato. So finally, uh, a set of domesticated genes is uh, now known for most uh, most important crops and what can we do with this information so you can see here the pyramid um, uh, about 250 thousands of species of higher plants and among them only 50 species are the main uh, crops main food crops 
And overall, there are just 150 species uh, represent uh, cultivated plants. So what can we do uh, with, uh, about, on information, with information about domestication? So we can uh, now uh, think about um, domestication of uh, new crops. For this, we have very valuable genetic resources. So in, uh, for example, in uh, Vavilov collection, there are more than 2,000 species, and most of them are wild relatives of cultivated ones. And uh, they, um, genome editing tools can be used uh, for um, mutating these uh, wild relatives. So why we need this? So wild relatives, uh, they were used uh, in crosses with cultivated plants. For example, wild potato, which is resistant uh, for Colorado beetle, was crossed uh, with cultivated potato uh, in order to transfer uh, resistance to this test. Uh, and finally, the hybrid was obtained uh, which uh, was uh, resistant uh, to the pest, but the tubers of this potato were not edible. So uh, this is the problem of uh, co-selection of undesired traits, traits with uh, target traits. And uh, with genome editing, so we can shape uh, these uh, wild relatives like donors of uh, useful traits, we can shape them uh, with uh, genome editing, uh, making some making some knockouts, uh, and after that using them as um, improved donors. So this is called domestication donor. So first conclusion: so with genetic technologies, we can learn domestication at the genetic level, and we can repeat domestication de novo within just one or two years and also we can create new crops so the next is climate change so how can genetic technologies be useful uh, for breeding in uh, uh, changing environment and changing climate so you can see here uh, the chain climate change uh, over the last 2000 years you can see that there were centuries when then it uh, climate um, was uh, more cold or more hot and uh, you know that uh, uh, archaeological uh, seeds which can be found in different regions they are now uh, analyzed at genetic level and they are uh, they can be compared with the current genetic diversity which is maintained in gene banks with uh, land races, with uh, modern varieties from different regions uh, of uh, from different continents, and you can select the most similar, uh, the most similar um, plants with uh, the most similar alleles and genes, uh, which in this information uh, can be used uh, for modeling. Uh, plants of future. So we learn, uh, let us say, we learn past uh, to um, get knowledge in order to uh, create plants for future. Uh, and so conclusion number two, uh, that genetic technologies can be useful to learn crop genotypes in seed from paleontology and archaeology studies and associates certain genes and allelic variants with climate conditions. And the second, we, uh, construct, we can construct the models and synthesize novel varieties for future climate challenges. Uh, the third is forgotten taste. So we often uh, tell that in supermarkets we have tasteless food. And uh, we remember, or our uh, parents, grandparents, they remember that the fruit test uh, was uh, different several several decades ago. So how we can uh, where we can find this uh, taste? Um, we can find this taste uh, in uh, collections. And here also I would like to uh, call your attention on uh, changing changing in trends in agriculture in uh, current century compared to 20th century. 
So in 20th century, the main trend was, let us say, from diversity to mono varieties. And mono varieties resulted in a big problem with plant diseases spread, with uh, requirement for increased uh, treatment of fields with chemicals. Uh, and uh, in its turn, it <coughs> resulted in dis destruction of soils and, and uh, finally in increased uh, burden on human health. So the second trend, the second trend uh, was uh, the shift from uh, tasty varieties, varieties with tasty fruit to tasteless products. And the reason is the, that uh, main breeding purposes in uh, last century were increasing yield. First of all, uh, breeders didn't care very much about the quality of fruits and seeds. And another goal was uh, ability of fruits and seeds for uh, transportation, for long storage, and so on. And this resulted in deterioration of taste and uh, in decrease of content of vitamins and nutrients uh, in uh, fruits. And um, finally, finally, again, uh, uh, because uh, the food uh, obtained from such, let us say, not taste, not, not quality seeds or fruits, uh, the final food products, they were needed uh, some uh, addition of some chemicals, some uh, which improved uh, quality. And finally, it also was, was not good for human health. But uh, today, today, uh, other trends uh, are uh, so breeders and uh, uh, producers, plant producers, they now uh, moved uh, from mono varieties to diversity. You can see uh, to the right the picture of, for example, of Krasnodar region fields, uh, colored with dif different colors, match uh, different varieties. So this is a special varietal policy, which is very useful to, uh, for uh, resistant to diseases. So uh, different varieties, they have resistant to different, um, uh, different diseases. And uh, if pathogen, if there will be some epiphytogia and uh, some pathogen cannot spread, uh, cannot spread uh, across uh, the whole region. Uh, this mean uh, decrease of uh, chemical treatments, and this means uh, very good uh, result finally for human health. And the second tre trend today is uh, from tasteless food to uh, healthy and tasty food to organic farming. And again, it is very important for human health. And uh, so, where can we where can we find the sources of uh, this? Let us say genes for tasty genes for health. So we can find them in uh, collections, in such collection like Wabilov collection, about which I said in the beginning. And um, uh, today, uh, it is very important to uh, join our efforts. I mean. Uh, geneticists, breeders, uh, and also scientists from chemistry, technology, biomedicine, to join our efforts to improve and to speed uh, obtaining uh, new varieties uh, for different diets, for functional food, and, fun and finally for our health. So the third conclusion that genetic technologies are useful to reconstruct varieties with the same natural taste like uh, land races had, and to develop tasty and healthful varieties for future. And uh, the next uh, about genetic technologies is uh, the um, application for uh, accelerated breeding. And um, here you can see again the growing contribution of genetics to the breeding process. 
So the long, long lasting, lasting domestication and so-called crowd uh, breeding uh, through the centuries and only uh, one uh, century and a half of uh, scientific breeding and then very short period uh, here shown with red color so-called period of marker assisted selection and the last one very short the, the period for genome editing a couple of words about what is marker assisted selection so uh, in the picture to the left uh, you can see a uh, scheme of chromosome with a gene, target gene, and uh, here you can see analysis, uh, simple PCR analysis of diagnostic marker, and this analysis can help us to predict which plant uh, will, uh, will uh, have uh, flowering time and heading uh, time uh, more earlier, and which will be more late. And this analysis can be done just in two weeks after sowing. So, and that means that you can save time, save money, decrease sown area. Uh, and here also a good example about uh, saving money. So these uh, circles, they mean amount of money spent for testing potato for resistant to nematode. You can see that the most expensive is laboratory phytopathology test. The medium expensive is field test and the cheapest is DNA test. And uh, here you can see time save uh, uh, in marker assisted selection of potato, about eight years, uh, marker assisted selection of wheat, about six years and even less compared to traditional breedings, uh, which uh, usually take us uh, 12, sometimes 15 or even 20 years. And uh, finally, marker assisted selection, let us say, it is not instead of traditional breeding. Uh, it is some kind of complementation. So here you can see below the formula. So marker assisted selection is traditional breeding with diagnostic DNA marker. And uh, here you can see an uh, example. Uh, we tried to achieve the same goal. The goal was, let us say, to paint wheat grains with some pigments. And these pigments are substances uh, which are natural antioxidants. So this, these are grains for the dietary food. And to the left, you can see the scheme how we can do it with marker assisted selection. So we saved four years. And now we uh, reach the same uh, with genome editing. And with genome editing, we saved already five years and a half. And uh, here you can see the young team who uh, was, uh, uh, who participated in this uh, project. And uh, when they moved to the practical application, uh, they made some I, I can even uh, say discover uh, some uh, discover some new things uh, in field of basic research in field of genetics. So first of all, they discovered them. They discovered the main anthocyanin regulator genes in cereals, and then they discovered novel cell structures called melanosomes, and also uh, we proved that uh, black plant pigments. Uh, are under control of the genes, which are very similar to genes which are responsible for melanin synthesis in our skin. And uh, finally, practical results. So uh, our team was the first who edited crop, crop plant in Russia. And so next conclusion is that genetic technologies are useful to control and even broaden genetic diversity and they are useful to speed the breeding process twice or more times. And uh, finally, um, how the process is going further. So we can see the statistics from 2013, so first application of this forecast system in plants. And first five years, it was uh, <coughs> uh, increased uh, significant increase of publication, increase of new target genes involved in genome editing. Uh, but uh, now we can see some kind of plateau. What happened? Uh, <clears throat> These five-year studies, they were based 
on three decade studies of molecular of plant molecular genetics. Uh, so now there is a deficit of new target genes, <clears throat> uh, and uh, also there are some regulatory restrictions. And uh, uh, what can we say? Uh, will uh, will this method will developed and uh, um, used further? Uh, or already we have some plate or and I uh, would like to say what is important for further movement uh, and further success of uh, genetic technologies application. I would like to state that this uh, that the main base is again genetic diversity. Why? Uh, so today, uh, in the context uh, of globalization and uh, open access to depositories of uh, big data, genomic data, genetic data. So who will have advantage of obtaining priority results? Um, maybe someone with uh, the best equipment or with the uh, biggest amount of money for research, uh, maybe. But uh, the main um, advantage is uh, genetic diversity, unique diver uh, genetic diversity, uh, which you can use to search new target genes and to discover um, some new things about how genetic and metabolic networks organized, uh, how, uh, <clears throat> how happens the formation uh, of um, agronomically important traits and so on. And again, genetic diversity is a big treasure. And uh, genetic diversity of cultivated plants is concentrated in gene banks in big collection. Here you can see the biggest world collections. Um, and uh, Vavilov collection uh, is the first, the oldest. And also in spite of, um, it is the fourth, uh, after USA, China, and India collection by uh, amount of accessions, uh, but it is uh, recognized that it is first uh, in genetic diversity and uniqueness. And more than 20% of accessions of field collections, they are unique, and they cannot be found uh, either in our gene banks or in farms of habitants. And <clears throat> Uh, here you can see uh, global statistics from FAO. So uh, you can imagine that uh, 1,750 gene banks uh, registered across uh, the all countries. Uh, however, the, most of them are very small gene banks, very small collections. Only 130 collections have more than 10,000 access accessions and only eight collections are such big like uh, listed before and also uh, and the biggest collections here uh, are in color and blue and you can see one place color it with red uh, but this is not gene bank this is seed vault in uh, Norway and <clears throat> when uh, this is really a big work to maintain such collections uh, there are uh, special si systems, special infrastructure, special system for documentation and so on. And there are two uh, basic types of um, genetic resources conservation, uh, ex situ and in situ. So we will talk to, uh, today a little bit about ex situ conservation. So ex situ means um, that uh, collection of samples and their transfer and storage outside of uh, their original habitats or uh, cultivation regions. And <clears throat> in each gene bank, you will find basic storage and active storage. So basic storage uh, at um, temperature minus 10, uh, from minus 10 to minus 20, with uh, seeds specially dried and uh, packed uh, with uh, vacuum. And this uh, basic collection is for, it is uh, not uh, used in regular work. So this is for such case uh, when it is uh, necessary to 
uh, restore sample from active collection. And active collection is needed for regular uh, investigation of samples and for and to make it accessible for applicants so uh, that uh, the samples uh, are needed to be spread to breeding centers and to research centers and here you can see some detail and some different difference of conservation of two major types of plants so most plants they can be propagated by seeds and uh, it's it's a little bit easier seed store and uh, uh, ma maintaining seed germination in the field but there are also plants which are vegetably pr propagated so with these types of plants it's a little bit more difficult so they cannot be propagated by, by seeds uh, you need to create uh, such perennial gardens uh, collection gardens to maintain them and also there are some uh, modern techniques of maintenance uh, of parts of such plants in liquid nitrogen and you can uh, regenerate this sample if it is needed and also in vitro collection and of course uh, collection is uh, big 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 data big data and uh, the management of collection is uh, quite difficult if you uh, if you do not uh, make um, a clear let us say structure of collection so here you can see your collection first divided to nine group by a group of different crops like wheat group or potato group <coughs> uh, other cereals uh, legumes vegetables and so on and here below you can see how uh, small uh, grains collection is divided to sub collections and even to the right, uh, you can see how wheat collection is divided to uh, different parts, uh, winter bread wheat, spring bread wheat, durum wheat. Uh, and uh, this um, structural organization is very important. And here you can see um, how can a breeder, breeder or researcher uh, uh, order uh, the sample and why it is important to have uh, a very well organized structure of collection and very well documentation and description if uh, there will be not such good organization so how can breeder uh, know uh, for example with breeder how he can know which uh, what sample uh, he need to order from uh, 30 thousands of samples for example which present in here and uh, the last what i would like uh, to say uh, that we, um, let us say, collect uh, not plants only. Uh, we also, if it is possible to say, uh, collect people, collect fu uh, future scientists, because this is uh, a big uh, problem, a big uh, competition between uh, young people who would like to go uh, to science. They very often uh, even uh, uh, young people who go to biology most of them dream to go to biomedicine um, <clears throat> and uh, not to agriculture so and uh, we and many other uh, agriculture institutes now work with children with school children so we uh, uh, to attract them to uh, our field science and um, uh, the second year we uh, conduct uh, a project uh, with um, Russian Geographical Society. So we study genetic diversity on fruit and berry plants uh, across the country with school children. So this is so-called citizen science. And also we organize and visit uh, and uh, so-called Vavil of Gardens um, for um, to, to explain uh, young people, to explain school children, what is genetic diversity, uh, what is genetic collection, uh, what are <coughs> uh, genetic technologies. And we have more and more such reveal of gardens. And um, also uh, we explain uh, school children uh, about you know, very interesting side of our work, uh, expedition collection missions, 
uh, and uh, to, to, to the different parts uh, of uh, our country. And uh, also we realized that uh, actually it is uh, quite late to learn genetics at the third year in university. In university. It is necessary to learn genetics at school. And this is not only for future biologists. This is um, just for people who will never become, um, who will never work with in biology or medicine. Uh, each, each of us uh, need, need to know, need to know a little bit about genetics uh, because when you have, in, when, when you are well informed, you can understand uh, whether it is necessary to hear and to believe some people who uh, talk you what, uh, what um, have you to eat, uh, how, um, uh, what kind of uh, medicine you need to get. So all people, they, they must be at least basically informed about new technologies. And of course, uh, we care not only about uh, school children, also, we have prog programs for bachelors and master students to, together with several universities. And uh, we have um, our own uh, postgraduate school in, in Lviv, which is uh, fast growing. And we have postgraduate students not only from Russia, but also from Kazakhstan and this year from Armenia and Tajikistan. And uh, finally, I would like to wish audience, I mean the students part of uh, our audience, uh, for each of you, uh, his own trajectory of further development, either to, uh, to the practical uh, application of uh, biological knowledge and genetic knowledge. Uh, and here, a lot of opportunities in technology, tra technology transfer in uh, such modern trends like organic farming and so on. And uh, for others uh, who uh, like to become a scientist and maybe to get a Nobel Prize, also there are a lot of opportunities when you work with plants. Uh, this again, genetic technologies, discovering new genes, new genetic systems and networks um, and so on. So with such good wishes, I would like to finish my presentation. Thank you.